Uh, just about the funniest picture in the papers this week, uh, I don't know if you saw it, is the, the one of Prince Charles in Uzbekistan wearing that ridiculous hat. Did you see it? Some, I think it was a wedding on it. He had this ridiculous fur sort of thing on his head. Actually, um, I've got to say, it was my mother's fault. Because <laughs> I said, um, I'm going to Uzbekistan this week. And she said, oh, really? Wear the fox hat. <laughs> Thank you. And the main story this week, John Major takes on Europe again, seeking to have the 48-hour week reversed. He wants to go for an 84-hour week instead. <laughs> I think, frankly, the whole thing's ridiculous. <laughs> A 48-hour week. That means some of our factory workers would finish work by Tuesday night. <laughs> um, so what are you going to do, Prime Minister? Well, it's simple, Jeremy. I shall be doing what every little boy does at Christmas. I shall be writing a letter to Santerre. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to know with this government these days what the truth is. John Major says he'll beat the 48-hour ruling. Michael Heseltine says our economy is the best in Europe. And Sir Nicholas Scott says he doesn't drink. <laughs> now, you know, <laughs> which do you believe? <laughs> the main government business these days is trying to find a form of words to get out of trouble. It must be like the old days of Call My Bluff. Bing, yes, and the word is civil service neutrality. And it's Michael Heseltine's turn. <laughs> Look, civil servants are neutral. They're there to help the government of the day. Could I help it if we've been the government of the day for the last 17 years? <laughs> I, I humbly submit that civil servants should therefore devote themselves to the Conservative Party. Ah, fair dues, I suppose. <laughs> it's the same story with the Willits hearing. Advisors brainstorming through the night to find new definitions for old words. Uh, want, want, uh, want like... Uh, uh, giraffe! Giraffe! Uh, <laughs> it's like charades, isn't it? Hamilton Inquiry, two words, whole thing, sounds like a cover-up. <laughs> ah, <laughs> on to the next word. Want, as in MP wants to avoid being found out. Your go, Prime Minister. Uh, want, <laughs> or want. <laughs> uh, it's an old word that means two things. Firstly, its original and literal meaning. Uh, and secondly, the meaning given to it by ministers seeking to get out of trouble. <laughs> by Jove, he's got it. By Jove, he's got it. On to films, and as Gordon Brown completes his conversion to conservatism in true blue, there are calls to ban David Cronenberg's film Crash, in which a couple get erotic thrills out of watching car crashes. And news emerges of a forthcoming movie entitled By-Election, in which large parts of the British electorate derive enormous sexual gratification out of watching conservatives lose. <laughs> Why ban the film anyway? I mean, how many people do you know that find car crashes sexy? Well, I think obviously in Formula <laughs> One... Uh... I saw a whole load of crashes at high speed and I can tell you there's something incredibly exciting about a large lump of metal flying up. Hey, look at that! Look at that! Look! Hey, 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 there goes the Benetton, there go the trousers, and there, 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 oh, this is absolutely incredible! Uh, the alternative to this is the Dutch approach, where apparently town residents are now putting sheep on public roads to slow down the traffic. <laughs> you know, that could only work in, in Holland, you know, where they'd say, oh, look, it's a sheep, we'd better slow down here. <laughs> and over here, it's, whoa, it's a nice bit of mutton, right, who's got the mint sauce? <laughs> Thank you. Well, of course, I, I recognised the boy's birthday card straight away by the writing. It said, uh, to whom it may concern. <laughs> Thank you, Margarita Prakata. <laughs> and now, moving swiftly on, it's time for the digital high-definition trans-global media revolution to begin as we switch on our very big telly and greet my next guest, the blue-eyed boy of the Tory right, the man who claimed he had a little list, but then size isn't everything, as we welcome <laughs> Social Security Minister Peter Lilly Savage. <laughs> Are you looking at my tits or what, Clive? Because <laughs> if you are, I'll come round there and thank you. <laughs> Peter, would I be correct in saying this is a bit of a change of image for you? No, you wouldn't, you friggin' fat fool. <laughs> I always dress like this on my day off. <laughs> Peter, or may I call you Lily, it seems so much more appropriate. No, you friggin' can't. The <laughs> average will do. <laughs> We've been hearing less than flattering reports about your behaviour recently. If you're talking about me getting the clap in Bournemouth, forget it. <laughs> well, we'll come to your conference speech later. I was referring here to your treatment of the unemployed. I've done everything I can for them lot. I've changed the name to Job Seekers, I've reduced the payments, and I've cut their entitlement period in half. 
What more can I do? Yeah, but Lily, from where I'm sitting, isn't a small carrot occasionally better than a large stick? If that's your excuse, you stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> You've frozen benefits for single mothers. You're planning to take driving licenses away from dole cheats and introduce sweeping new powers to remove benefit from anyone who doesn't dress or behave properly. And a snoopers hotline to shop people on the fiddle. Are you trying to flatter me, Chuck? Surely, <laughs> Lily, this is a bit odd coming from the party who insists that they're not going to run a nanny state. Oh, get real, Clive. This isn't a nanny state. This is some big bully standing over the baby saying, either you stop crying or I'll hit you with my friggin' crowbar. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Peter, do you have a word of comfort for people who think that if they lose their jobs, they might not be able to survive on the benefit available? Yeah, let me put their minds at ease straight off. You're right. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Alf Peters and Peter Lilly. How do I get the Prime Minister's attention? <laughs> well, usually I just shout, Basil! <laughs> hey, come on, Willet. Why should you take all the rap yourself? You're going down for this one, everyone knows that. Do yourself a favour. Tell us what really happened, and the judge will go easy on you. Uh, OK. Well, you, you better take this down, because I'm telling it like it is, just like it happened. Sure, I wrote the memo to try and influence the committee. But you got to understand why. I, I was part of a gang, a big gang, the biggest gang in town. We controlled everything. Law and order, defence, the public sector borrowing requirement for the first quarter of 97. But when Muggsy Hamilton got caught fingering this von Dulix from the Alphia job, I figured it could bring down the entire operation and let the Blair mob muscle in. See, I wanted to impress. Make out I was some big shot. Maybe catch Mr. Big's eye. And the way I figured it, the select committee was full of our boys, so they kind of owed us one. See. I figured all I had to do was lean on one or two of them, persuade them to go easy on Hamilton where they could, and where he's in deep, to get them to stay sturm and leave it for the courts to decide. See, we reckon Russ Bridger and his mob wouldn't have the guts for a fight and would turn patsy, leaving Hamilton to walk free. Only we guessed wrong. And when the DA told us we gotta come clean with all the paperwork, well, Hamilton and his money man Greer started sniping at each other and suddenly, like everyone said, it was my fault, it was my fault. Can you believe that? <laughs> hey, you gotta, you gotta believe me, fellas. I, I wasn't making nothing out of this. I, I, I got a junior ministerial post and a safe seat to look after, just like you. Hey, it's not me, it's, it's the big guys you want. It's good. Oh, give me a hand here, guys. Please, pal, please. Oh, I, I don't want my political career to die here. Hey! Uh, well, what do you think? I still think it's better if you say it was merely a matter of misinterpretation. Ah, oh, right. A rehearsal over. Reconvene Monday. <laughs> George Parr, you are a businessman and a member of the Institute of Directors. What is your view on the European directive about working hours? Well, I, I think we have to take a balanced view. I think that we have to look at the thing calmly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and obviously, looking at it calmly, it is a plot, um, clearly, by Chancellor Cole and the Bundesbank to ruin British industry. <laughs> And I, I think we should, it would do as well to, to remind Chancellor Cole and the Bundesbank that if it hadn't been for British sacrifice in the Second World War, they would be now living under German rule. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> they are living under German rule. <laughs> well, it serves them right. They should have thought of that <laughs> beforehand, that's all I can say, before they started all this. I mean, it is, they, they are very jealous of... of, of, of our success, our economic success, they look across and see our achievement. Are you, who makes Japanese cars? We do. <laughs> who makes German cars and French cars? We do. Who makes Korean television sets? We do. And why do we do it? Because we do it cheaper. <laughs> and why do we do it cheaper? Well, I suppose... But, uh, excuse me, I'm giving the answers here. <laughs> I was only going to ask you... I, I'm, I'm asking the questions, too. Why, <laughs> why do we do it cheaper? Be because if we don't do it cheaper, because... We send our workforce home early, uh, or, or let them go off on paid holidays whenever they feel like it. <laughs> we do it by working them harder and paying them less. That's what's called a flexible labour market. <laughs> but is it in the workers' interest? Oh, well, of course it is. They want it that way. Why? Well, they'd be fired if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't we be equally competitive by having a, a highly motivated, highly skilled and highly paid workforce? <laughs> Come on, I mean, 
<laughs> you might as well say, yes, it would be nicer if you won the World Cup. I mean, where, where, are, we, where are we going to get these people from? Well, I, I imagine you, you'd educate them, you'd, you'd train them. How, 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 how do you mean educate them? How, how do you mean? How do you well, I mean, uh, as they do in, in, in Germany. Oh, because they do in Germany. Of course, they, they do it in Germany because they spend money on it. We don't spend money on it. <laughs> That's what we're good at, not spending money. Well, what we want is to turn out a lot of ignorant morons who will work all the hours God sends doing boring, repetitive tasks for next to nothing. That's what we're good at. <laughs> and we can celebrate it. That's our, that gives us our competitive edge, you see. So, <laughs> so you don't think that workers should have any kind of protection at all? Protection against what? Losing their job? Look, 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 look. This is all waffle from Brussels. Let, let, me, let me put you, give you a, 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 concrete, a concrete instance here. Now, I, one of the companies that I, I run is in the food manufacturing uh, 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 business. And uh, you have George Parr's gourmet meat pies. <laughs> now, yes, in fact, I have heard of those. Um, um, our dog died after eating. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Yes, yes. Oh dear. Yes. Well, um, yes, the dogs usually come into it at a different stage. Uh, <laughs> 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 however, however, be, be that as it may. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, in our uh, meat pie factory, we, the, 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 the central part is, is, the, is the, what we call the gristle pounding shed, where the gristle is pounded. Now, I have a security guard who guards that, uh, the, the, the gristle pounding shed, and uh, he works 110 hours a week <laughs> for £2.80 an hour. You see? Now, if he could only work 48 hours a week, then, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would have to employ another uh, security guard. Well, that'd be rather good. You'd be giving someone else a job, wouldn't well, you? Well, yes, but I couldn't afford to pay him two pounds eighty a week. I could only afford to pay each of them half, one pound forty a week. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, that would mean that, that my present security guard would, would get one pound forty a week for 48 hours. You'd get 62 pounds 70 a week. Nobody can live on that. No. Nobody can live. Well, I mean, our, our, our maid can live on it, but then she's, <laughs> she's Filipino and she has her own cardboard box. <laughs> Yes, but, uh, I mean, presumably, in any case, he, he, he wouldn't want to work for that. No, no, he, he wouldn't want to, but he couldn't afford, he couldn't afford to. So, so he'd be better off on the dole. Mm. So there would I be, you see, without a security guard and my gristle pounding uh, shed. So anybody could come in and steal my gristle. <laughs> and, 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 and so that um, uh, I'd go bust. I'd have to close the factory down. There'd be 15 some illegal Somali immigrants out of work. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, a great British product would be ancient history. As if you look to the sell by date, it usually is. <laughs> Surely the, the European Commission has said that the reason for imposing this 48 hour week is for health reasons, that it's very unhealthy for people to work well, vastly I, long I, hours. Look, I've run 23 companies. I, I, I couldn't do that without working very long hours. I work 14, 15 hours, hours a week, uh, <laughs> hours, sorry, hours a day, and, and, and um, you know, it doesn't do me any harm. Surely the, 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 the crux of this is a philosophical mm. question, isn't it? I mean, surely. The economy should exist in order to serve our society. No, no, it's the other way around. Society exists to serve the economy. But, I mean, wouldn't you say that things ought to be arranged in such a way as to make people's lives better? No, no, they, look, people's lives can be better on the continent, in France and Germany and in Portugal, if that's what they want. <laughs> they can be better, we can be rich. Or at least, <laughs> I can be rich. George Parr, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.